Good morning, everyone. As we begin our worship service this morning, I'd like to say that there's no better place to be than here. This time, on Sunday morning, to worship with you, praise God, listen to the word. I'd ask that you stand as we sing Victory Chant. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to see. Your life frees me to see. I will praise you all my days. I will praise you all my days. make this morning. Uh, for the visitors, there are visitor cards in the back and in each door. Uh, if you would, please fill one of those out and put it uh, in the box or give it to one of the uh, people at the door so we can have a record of your uh, attendance today. Also, it'll help us to uh, pray for any concerns that you may have that you've written down. Uh, leads us into the prayer cards. They're also at each door and in the back. Those are very important, I'm telling you. I, as a recipient of those cards, for me and my family, they were great. So please fill them out and send them in. There will be a deacon's meeting next week uh, at uh, 6 o'clock p.m. The youth is having a movie night. Friday, March the 18th, from 7 to 10. Uh, you're asked if you want to be there to bring a chair, blanket, or something comfortable to uh, lounge on. Um, we have uh, the memorial grounds and landscaping project that is going on. Uh, it's getting ready to start up. It'll be here in front of the CLC and over in the Triangular Park. Uh, if you want to uh, donate to that, you can either put it down as memorial grounds in the memory of someone or just uh, landscaping. Uh, there are some other announcements in your bulletin. Please take note of them. Uh, if you would, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, creator of heaven and earth, and Father to all of us, we come here this beautiful in this beautiful place of worship to praise your name above all others. We can't imagine the ability to, for you to be able to hear and to answer the prayers and address each one in your time. I ask for your continued grace to the families that have lost loved ones and those who are sick. Please be with us as we walk through each day, trying our best to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Again, I thank you for your love 
In Christ's name I pray. Amen. It's your neighbors, Jim and Julina Sanders. From next door. How are you? Hey, hey, we totally know that you don't like going to church with us, so we're not even here to invite you to no. church, all right? Well, we're not even here to tell you the four little happy hops to heaven. <laughs> we're not even here to, to sell you fire insurance. <laughs> you know, from down there. You get that hell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, 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 hey. Honestly, honestly, yeah. what we want to do right now is we just want to serve you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. That's, that's a good thing. Oh, that's, a good thing. That's, a good thing. that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Okay, don't be afraid. Hold the phone. Hold the phone. No, we know that you don't get us. No. And why should you? You're a heathen. That's we get right. that, all right? Yeah. yeah. So what we want to do is just be here to understand you and to serve you in yeah. some ways. You know, what can we do for you? That's yeah. what Jesus asked all the time. Yeah. Now, we noticed on your mailbox that you had some balloons out. There. Did someone die? Did someone die? Can we offer some condolences? No. Oh, you had a baby. Oh, oh. oh. Pink means joyfulness. I, I yeah, get it. I, get it. I told you. <laughs> okay, now how about this? Can we wash something for you? You're yeah, probably tired. That's a great idea. Maybe we could wash your dishes. Yeah, or, or, or wash your car. W w wash, wash the lawn. Wash, wash the mailbox. mailbox. Wash the dog. Oh, <laughs> we, the dog. we could even wash the washer for you. <laughs> Not. I love putting that word at the end of a sentence. Oh, do it again, do it again. I got nothing. Not. <laughs> he said what I did. I brought the comedy back around. I brought the comedy. I'm sorry. No, really. How about we not do any of no. that, but we just come to do what we should do and let us just wash your feet? Yeah, because you know, Je wait, hang on. I'm not done. Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and so we want to wash your feet. Yeah, we, we know you're not our disciple. Yet. Yes. <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. Yeah. All right, one more do is I just got this water basin here yeah. and I just want to wash your foot. Yeah. All right, now stick out so your big toe. Just stick out your big toe. Come on, no, no. This will be over in just a minute. Yeah, just, it's just take yeah. a second. Okay, now I got the shoe. Now just give me your toe. Yeah, all right, just, come on, just give me your toe. Well, that's a fun howdy do. I know. All right, well, we'll just leave the shoe here. We'll leave the brownies. I guess we'll go next door. Okay, can I can I talk more this time? It's not your place, baby. Okay. What a friend we have indeed. I can honestly say I probably shouldn't follow that. <laughs> Let's all stand together as we sing The Solid Rock and As the Deer. I hope he's built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. Trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When 
Let's pray. Precious Lord, O oh God, you are our God. We will seek you earnestly. Our souls do thirst for you and our flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. Lord, we've come to this place today with so many concerns. We feel anxiousness for the world around us. And we remember that you've told us if we seek you, we will find you if we search with all our hearts. And so here we are. We're searching for you with all our hearts. Father, be with the people of Ukraine. Direct the world leaders to be courageous. Be with the church in Ukraine, giving them strength to help their fellow countrymen. Lord, be with our country, be with our community, be with our church, that we would look to you for direction and that we would seek to do your will. We lean on you, God, and we believe in your goodness. Amen. I would like to ask the members of the Pastor Search Committee to join me on the platform, please. I would like to ask you as a congregation to take this responsive reading. Let me see if I can introduce these people. John Harris is on the end. He is the co-chair of the committee. Uh, Chad Chrisman, did I say it right? Close, uh, is on the committee. Tim Williams is uh, corresponding secretary. Did I get that right? Uh, Jolly Sharp is a co-chair. Uh, and Janet Logan is on the committee as well. Uh, we are missing Stephen Moses, uh, who is not here today, and we're also missing Joseph West, who is not here. We had a good meeting this past Sunday afternoon, uh, kind of an organizational meeting. Uh, they have not found the pastor yet. Uh, they are still in the organizational phases. They're going to res read this responsively with me. And then, of course, the congregation has something at the very end. The covenant that is spoken of in this response is on the flip side of that. Uh, we'll give you an opportunity to read that during my sermon. It will be able to keep you awake during that time, give you something to do. Okay, may we read this responsively. God has saved us and called us with a holy calling according to his purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus. Recognize the recognizing the importance of the assignment to serve on the pastor search committee. Do you, the members of this committee, accept this responsibility in which our church has entrusted to you? And do you covenant together to make this a priority in your lives? We do. Do you as members of the pastor search committee agree to those things outlined in the search committee covenant? During the fulfillment of your assignment, will you respect one another, lay personal agendas aside, disagree in love, and support one another as brothers and sisters in Christ? Will you be open and committed to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and guard with utmost confidentiality all matters that relate to the pastor search process? May we have a prayer at this time. God, we pray for John and Jolly and Kim and Stephen and Joseph and Chad. We pray that you will lead and bless 
each member of this search committee. May they be able with your strength to fulfill the responsibilities and the commitment that they have made. May they respect each other and may they be guided by your spirit. We pray for guidance and wisdom and patience. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we add uh, Stacy to our group. She'll be singing lead on Thank You Jesus for the Blood.
my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, and then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood. Sometimes you say amen and sometimes you just say wow. Play, you can do anything, huh? You want to preach? <laughs> uh, I, I made a request last week of the people that are doing the flowers. And I said, can you put some sunflowers in it? I learned from Jane last week, and then I, it's true, the national flower of Ukraine is the sunflower. And so, we, we have some sunflowers here today because it's on our hearts. They're on our minds. We hurt with them. And we pray for them. Uh, today I'm going to preach a sermon that you've heard a hundred times at least, and you could preach it, on a passage of scripture that is very, very, very familiar. 
It's about the Good Samaritan. Now, if you read closely in the scripture text, it never says Good Samaritan. We've added that. It's an editorial remark in the column that says that. It's the heading of my scripture says the Good Samaritan. But in the scripture itself, it doesn't say Good Samaritan. You've heard the story before. Listen to it again as recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 25 through 27. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. One translation calls it an expert in the law. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what's written in the law? What, what do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you, you've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him pass by on the other side. But the, a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Jesus said, after telling this story, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. So we come today to talk about a text that is very, very familiar. My hunch is that even before I read it, you could tell the story. You've heard it many times. And the problem is we've heard it so many times, it's hard to make meaning of it. We used to sing a song, Tell Me the Old, Old Story. Write on my heart every word. And the fact is we need to hear the old, old story over and over again to get it not just in our head, but in our hearts and in our lives. And so we hear this old, old story again. But before we get to the story of the Good Samaritan, let me back up a bit. Because there's a part of the story that we don't often see. And it's contained in chapter 9. And it's verses 51 through 55. And the, 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 the editorial heading in my Bible calls it Samaritan Opposition. As the time approached for him to be taken up into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into to a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was headed to Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked him, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. Interesting, isn't it, that he was not even welcome in a village in Samaria, but then he uses a Samaritan as the hero of this story just a little bit later. A couple of things about this text. Uh, in Luke's gospel, this is the first time Jesus as, is presented as going to Jerusalem. He's, one translation says he set his heart 
to Jerusalem. Another, the one we read, says he resolutely was going to Jerusalem. You see, he knew what he was headed for. And as we read the various scriptures in, in Luke headed to the cross, it, it seems like a meandering kind of way Jesus is going. But the point was he was resolutely set for Jerusalem knowing the cross was inevitable. And so as we get ready for Good Friday and Easter, we too are traveling with Jesus along this way. Uh, the second thing I want to say about this text is that it happened in Samaria and they were not too hospitable to Jesus. And the disciples were ready to call down fire on them. But Jesus said, let's go to another village. But then Jesus uses a story of a Samaritan to make a point to this religious leader. In fact, how many times have we used the word Good Samaritan even in our world? I understand that all 50 states of these United States have Good Samaritan laws. In other words, if, if you uh, are trying to help somebody in need, you cannot be held liable uh, for doing that. It's a good Samaritan law. It's amazing, 20, 20 centuries plus. Uh, and, and it was not even something that necessarily happened. It was just a story. It was a parable. And, and we still use this phrase in our world today. Societies in biblical days, even as in our day, were kind of tribal. They identified with my people and your people. And there was a lot of hostility to the Samaritans between Jews of Judah and Galilee and those people who lived in Samaria. Those people. Uh, the center of worship for Samaritans was Mount Gerizim rather than Jerusalem. And so amazing that the first listeners of this story would have been shocked. Uh, as I read this story, three things begin to unfold. As we begin to read this section of scripture, we observe a man who had a small neighborhood. It, it was this religious leader He's referred to as a lawyer, but he was not a lawyer in, in our sense of the word. He was not an attorney, as it were. He, he, was a, he was a legal expert in the religious law of the land at that time. He had a conversation with Jesus, and it was not really a polite conversation. Over and over again, these religious leaders are trying to put Jesus to the test. And it was a test of wits. Maybe the motivation was to discredit Jesus among his followers. But note that the lawyer in Luke's gospel is not a lawyer in today's sense of the word. The lawyer's question gave him away. It appears that he had no trouble in loving his neighbors as long as you define neighbors as my kind of people. Like the lawyer, uh, the lawyer wanted some way to show that his definition of neighbor was adequate. Uh, verse 29 says, he desired to justify himself, who is my neighbor. Notice Jesus doesn't answer him directly. On Wednesday nights, the uh, past few weeks, we've been discussing a book titled, uh, Jesus is the question. He asked at least 307 questions that are reflected in the New Testament and answers less than 10. 
And even when he answers questions, they're kind of indirect. And so this lawyer asked Jesus a question, and instead of him answering that directly, he tells a story. But the lawyer kind of gave himself away, but the way he asked the question, his neighborhood was a little bit small. But the neighborhood of the Samaritan, here was a man that was despised by Jewish people who became the hero of this story that Jesus tells. In the Good Samaritan story, Jesus indicates that the law of love puts an end to legalism. We are simply to love one another as he loved us. I like the way Barbara Brown Taylor explains this story. She points out the number of verbs that are used in relation to the priest and Levite. Just two verbs. They saw this man in need, one verb. They passed by on the other side. But if you count them, there are probably a dozen, maybe more than a dozen verbs used in relation to the good Samaritan. The Samaritan comes near, he sees, he is moved, he goes near him, he bandages his wounds, he pours oil and wine on them, he puts the man on his animal, he brings him to an inn, he takes care of him, he takes money out of his own pocket, <clears throat> he gives it to the innkeeper, he asks the innkeeper to take care of the half-dead man, saying that he'll come back and pay whatever is needed. A dozen, maybe 14 verbs used in relation to the Good Samaritan. Yes, we believe in salvation by grace through faith, but what we do shows whether or not we are truly following Jesus. Taylor suggests that the key verb is the first verb, and that is, without, nothing el without it, nothing else would follow. He comes near the man. This is a little bit of an indictment to me sometimes because sometimes if people are offensive and if they're not like me, I, I just don't want to come near them. I, I don't know if I'm calling your name or not, but my hunch is too often, that's kind of the way we relate. Sometimes, we can't see beyond a person's offensiveness or differentness. But this Good Samaritan story reminds us of the character of Christ and the character of God that God loves every one no matter how offensive and different they are from us. So we have a man with a small neighborhood and a man with a bigger neighborhood. And then we have another question. You see, Jesus was asked a question. He, he answered it by telling a story, and then he asked another question. He didn't really answer the question. He asked a question, but the asking of the question provided the answer he was looking for. <clears throat> Verse 29, the lawyer had said, who is my neighbor? In Verse 36, after telling the story, Jesus asked a different question. Which one of these do you think proved to be neighbor? Maybe the lawyer and all of us listening to the parable need to ask even another question underneath that question. Whose neighbor can I be? It may be easy to view the love commandment too narrowly, wondering whom must I treat as my neighbor? People that have the same values as I have? People like me, 
by telling the parable, Jesus maybe is trying to help us see that we should take the, the initiative in recognizing every person as neighbor. At the end of the day, Jesus didn't actually answer the question. He left it up to the lawyer and to us to answer the question. Fred Craddock uh, was a teacher of preachers. He was a teacher of a generation of preachers. He was a preacher uh, extraordinaire. He, he was a Disciples of Christ pastor. And, and he was quite a storyteller. In fact, I understand uh, that probably more Baptist preachers tell Fred Craddock stories than, than any other. And I have one for you this morning. Fred Craddock tells a story about Albert Schweitzer. He says, I think I was 20 years old when I read that Albert Schweitzer's, when I read Albert Schweitzer's book, Quest for the Historical Jesus. I found his Christology woefully lacking, more water than my wine. I marked it up, I wrote in the margins, I raised questions of all kind, and one day I read in the Knoxville News Sentinel that, Fred, that Albert Schweitzer was going to be in Cleveland, Ohio to play the dedicatory concert for a big organ in a church up there. According to the article, he would remain afterward in the fellowship hall for a conversation and refreshments. Craddock bought a bus ticket. He said, I worked out my questions. I wrote down dozens of questions against the chance that I would have time to just corner Albert Schweitzer and, and put him on the spot. Get him to answer these questions that he had raised in his book. Craddock goes on to say, I went there, I heard the concert, I rushed into the fellowship hall. I got a seat in the front row and waited with my lap full of questions. After a while, he came in. Shaggy hair, big mustache, stooped, 75 years old. You know, he was a master organist, a medical doctor, a philosopher, a biblical scholar, a lecturer, a writer, everything. And I had a front row seat. He was just right there. Came in with a cup of tea, some refreshments. He stood in front of the group and he was right there in front of me. He thanked everybody. Schweitzer said, you've been warm, hospitable. I wanna thank you for that. I wish I could stay longer among you. I must go back to Africa because my people are poor and diseased and hungry and dying. And I have to go. We have a medical station. If there's anyone here in this room who has the love of Jesus, would you be prompted by that love to go with me and help me? Craddock said he melted. I looked down at my questions. They were so absolutely stupid, he says of his questions. And then he said, I learned again what it means to be a Christian and had hopes that I could be that someday. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. It's in all four Gospels. Uh, I believe the only parable that is found in all four Gospels. It's in my head. I know what the Good Samaritan story is about. When, when you think about it, this is really, this is really a characteristic of the entire ministry of Jesus. It is a summary of his actions, of going close to people 
and touching them and ministering to them, all people across the board. It, it is a role model. It is an inspiration for generations of people. And it is an inspiration for me. And my prayer is I could follow the words of Jesus when he said to that lawyer, go and do likewise. May we pray. Compassionate God, how easy you love those who look unlovable to us. How readily you welcome undesirables into your home. We confess how slow we are to follow your example. We pray that we would turn our hearts toward all who are considered outcast and shunned and unclean so that we may love our neighbors for the sake of the one who became flesh to cleanse the world of sin and death forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In a moment, the praise group is going to come and lead us in a time of commitment. It is a, a time of music, but it's a time that each of us can recommit our hearts and lives to serve a Savior such as this. May we stand as we sing. something. We have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that uh, Philip and Peggy Johnson have sold their house. And the bad news is they're leaving us. Uh, we celebrate with you the sale of your house. We don't celebrate with you your departure. Uh, I have only known uh, Philip and Peggy for a little while. Philip has served on the interim arrangements committee. And uh, I just want to say thank you for our friendship to both of you. And I'm sure the congregation would want to express this to you as well. Uh, 
we would ask for a speech, but I've not told you ahead of time. But uh, God's speed, as you move, I understand you're moving, your, your things are moved, already started being moving, but you move on Wednesday and close on Friday. And we'll be not sure exactly where you're going to end up, somewhere in North Carolina. So uh, best wishes and God's speed as you leave us. May we pray. God, we thank you for your presence with us all of the days of our lives, and, and we thank you for your presence in times of transition. We pray that you would be with your servants, Philip and Peggy, in this significant transition in their lives. We pray your strength and blessing upon them, even as we continue to pray your strength and blessing upon us as we serve you here at this congregation. Go with us as we depart from this place and guide us and lead us and protect us. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.